There's this myth that Silicon Valley companies are always started in garages, but there are other options. The biggest company in the networking business, for example, was started in a living room in this house where Len Bozak and Sandy Lerner used to live. They were Stanford academics, but they were in different departments on different computer networks and unable to send email messages like, did you feed the cat? So they invented a way of networking networks with things called routers. The company they started in 1983, Cisco Systems, today does $10 billion a year in business. Routers created great wealth for the Cisco founders, Sandy Lerner and her former husband, Len Bozak. Their story is a classic nerd saga that started by accident and ended in a boardroom drama that many company founders have experienced to their cost. Was it your, your love of computers and networking that drew you two together? Or he had great legs or what? You know, I'll just have to tell you something that's so bizarre, you'll just have to assume that it's true. Len's mother had done this miraculous job and Len actually knew how to bathe and eat with silverware and I was absolutely enchanted. You know, he used to take whisk and like wash his collars and cuffs, which was way more than I ever did and I just, I just didn't think that a more perfect man could exist. Let's meet Len Bozak and find out about his work ethic. Sincerity begins uh, at a little over 100 hours a week. You can probably get to 110 on a sustained basis, but it's hard. You have to get down to eating once a day and showering every other day, things of that sort, to, to really get uh, your life organized to work 110 hours a week. And the, and, and the level that follows sincerity, uh, what do we call that? Commitment. Len was a brilliant network technologist. Here he is, hard at work, in a snapshot from Sandy's Cisco scrapbook. It was do-it-yourself networking. If you wanted it, you had better do it yourself because no one else was going to do it for you. You couldn't buy it. We basically pulled wire through manholes. We pulled wire through disused sewer pipe. Um, we built a lot of things by ourselves. I mean, it was very, very much, a, at that point, a, a guerrilla action. We had no money, and we certainly didn't have any official sanction. Um, in the end, I guess the university was kind of allowed not to like it, but they did get a network out of it. The Stanford campus was 16 square miles. In 1984, its 5,000 computers were grouped in their own networks in separate buildings. Like islands, they needed causeways or bridges to connect them into a campus-wide network. We first built some bridges, and then we built some crude routers, and then we built better routers. and That solved, for Stanford, the same sort of problem that it solved uh, 10 years earlier for ARPA, how to use a computer anywhere you want it. On the digital highway, packets are blasting this way and that, going from network to network on the way to their ultimate destinations. At every point where one network is linked to another, there's a box called a router. Think of a router as a traffic cop. Like the cop, a router does three things. It stops traffic, it starts traffic, and it gives directions. So routers keep local packets from leaving their own network and clogging the internet. Internet packets they let go through and even give them directions to the next router. What routers don't do is eat donuts or give tickets. Once Len and Sandy had solved Stanford's networking problem, they saw an opportunity to offer the solution to other users. But Stanford didn't want to do it. And so we kind of really tried to get them to license the technology to these other universities and they just were not going to do it um, and so with tears in our eyes we took our five dollars up to this you know secretary of state's office in san francisco and made cisco systems and took it anyway so how did you go about it well in the same tradition that uh, anyone else in the gulch does uh, you go out and buy a bunch of parts and try and make the stuff and uh, then go sell it and uh, solve the problems that come up that are Len and Sandy's dedication wasn't in question. This archival gem from 1989 may be a little low on production values, but it shows just how single-minded these two were. In part, the result of some fairly unsophisticated. Shut it off. All right, get on video. Well. That's very interesting. That wasn't the Wealthweek Marketing Department bombing 
the Cisco premises. That was a genuine San Francisco earthquake. Looks like not overlooked. even an earthquake could divert their attention so from the back. glorious business back. of routers and, and bridges. <laughs> so the Cisco headquarters was their house. The technology was, well, borrowed from Stanford, and their operating budget was plastic. You sort of uh, spend against your credit cards and hope that the checks come in from your customers fast enough to uh, meet your uh, expenditures. How did you decide how much to charge for your, for your products? We guessed. Now, how big a business could you build on your credit cards? About a half a million dollars a month. Well, one bedroom was uh, the lab. Uh, another bedroom was uh, office space. And when it was time to build and test something, well, that was the living room. We financed the company on credit cards. We were turned down by 70 or 80 venture capitalists. Um, yeah, it was, it was pretty touch and go. There's a downside to VC involvement. For all that money, they expect to own most of the company, to sit on the board, to tell you whom to hire, to generally question the competence of the founder to run the company. It can end in tears. Don Valentine was venture capitalist number 77, and his previous investments show that he understood the potential of this business. We knew from the experiences at Apple and at 3Com that the world was going to be connected. At that point, I think we were, Cisco was doing, I think, a quarter million, maybe, maybe 350,000 a month uh, without a professional sales staff and without an uh, official, conventionally recognized marketing campaign. So it wasn't a bad business just right then. And so I think just for the novelty of it, uh, the folks at Sequoia listened to us. We ended up taking money from Don Valentine and Sequoia Capital, who's a very savvy player. And Len and I were not, and I think that's probably about the best way to, to put that. Don does just what he does. He has a formula, and he executes against it. And that doesn't make him a good or a bad guy, just what he is. The commitment we jointly made to each other is that we at Sequoia would do a number of things. We'd provide the financing, we would find and recruit management, and we would help create a management process, none of which existed in the company when we arrived. Sandy and I agreed to a forfeiture contract, a type of indentured servitude, where if we didn't do what the company asked, they would have the right to repurchase the shares that we actually already owned. We end